I want everybody to stand with me before we jump into this word. I want us to be ready. I want us to be alert. The Bible says, be alert, be present, be leaned in, be ready to hear a word from God. And many times we can check out. That we, it's easy to just kind of hear details or hear information and not understand that it's revelation. And I want to I wanna share something with you today, and I've got a lot of information I want to share. And if you ever heard me preach, you know that I am a revelatory preacher. I'd rather throw the notes out and just preach whatever is in my heart. But there are times where God kind of stills me and says, there's some information I want to make sure that people have. And so today is that day, and I've kind of been deep diving into the the uh, resurrection of Jesus and the cross of Jesus. And I've been listening to debates for atheists and Christians debate and duke it out. And, and what I'm going to share with you today is just a very minuscule moment and just a few um, pieces of evidence that I have found that I feel is important for us to, to deliver today. But I would encourage you after today, if you're peaked at all, or if this is something that you're interested in at all, or maybe you're doubting and wavering in your faith. You don't really know what you believe. I would encourage you to just don't let Sunday morning be the only time you eat. Don't let Sunday morning be the only time you're searching and, and seeking and pursuing God. When you seek him, you'll find him. Well, I did, I did. I went to church, so that should be it. No, this is just, this is not even the tip of the iceberg. There's so, there's only so much I can do in 35 minutes. There's so much more. And as you deep dive, as you pursue God, it gets more and more exciting. It gets more and more real. He becomes so alive. That song we sang today, we stand on your word. It never fails. When you read God's word, you realize his word is alive. It's a living, breathing book. It's alive. Come on, anybody believe that today? I want us to pray because we're going to set the atmosphere for what I believe God's going to do in the next two weeks before Easter. Let's pray. Father, I thank you today that we can come before you with worship, with singing, with declaration. Father, I thank you that your presence is here and has uplifted us and encouraged us. And God, we are forever changed in this place. If we'll receive it, God, you can do miracles in our lives. Your word said that now unto him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we could ever ask or think. I thank you according to the power that works in us. I thank you that there's a power working in us, God, that will that will recognize the truth of your word. And as we worship you now in, in, in truth, I thank you today that our spirit is now going to absorb the truth of God's word. Thank you that today we can be leaned in and we can, we can be people who are just open. God, I pray we would just be open today. We would just lay aside any cynicism or, 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 or wavering in our faith and just be leaned in. Holy Spirit, speak to us today. Speak to every one of us today. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Somebody say this. Say this out loud. Say, He is not here. He is risen. Come on, say it again. He is not here. He has risen. I want you to say it like you believe it. If you're a Christ follower, He is not here. He is risen. Now shout about it right now. Come on, shout about it. He is not in the grave. He is risen. The tomb is empty. And Jesus is alive. Come on, Jesus is alive. He's not dead. We don't serve a dead God. We serve a God who's alive, and He's active, and He's in this room right here. Woo! Yeah! Okay, this is what I'm talking about. This band just pushes me. Y'all push me, and then I can't get to the message. All right, sit, 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 sit. But thank you guys. You're amazing. And don't stop pushing. I love it, okay? I love it. I think it's amazing. I want to talk to you today real quick about something that is, again, but on my heart. I have been, I would say, nerding out a little bit. But for the nerds in the room, you might not appreciate it. I have been, I have, or maybe you would, but I have been studying, researching, spending my days just listening so much to just the, the different sides of the debate. I've watched um, people who were from the Jewish faith and they have debated 
Christian theologists and theists and, and brilliant thinkers and, and people that are debaters on these subjects. And I have learned so much. Again, this is just a little of what I feel like we can handle today. We'll probably talk a little bit more about it next Sunday. But I feel it's so important because Easter comes and we've got about 20, 25 minutes to share the most incredible miracle that's ever happened in the, on the face of the earth. And so I thought, no, we're going to start a little early and treat it like it's starting today because it's resurrection season. How many of you need a dream to be resurrected? How many of you need a, a, your future to be resurrected? How many, how many of you need to stop looking at your past because it's dead and start asking God to do new things in your life? Well, that's why the resurrection is so important. Luke said in 24, 6, he said, he's not here. He's risen. He looked in an empty tomb and recognized that it, there was no dead body in it. When Pastor Dan and I, we've been to Israel twice and we've been able to go to where they, they believe Jesus was. They believe he was in this garden tomb and they, they tell you exactly why they believe it. They don't know for sure, but they believe that this is where his body was buried. And when you're there, you're blown away. Like, this is it. I feel him. He's here. But when you open up a tomb, it overwhelms you when you realize there's no one in that grave. There was, there was, there's no one there. There's no body. There's not even a, 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 a something to symbolize that there was a body there. And it's very overwhelming. In John 20 verse 19, it says on the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. So we see so many moments where Jesus appeared after the resurrection. So there's a reason why we believe that the resurrection is not a myth. It's a miracle. There was a, a, a I'm going to just start off with a funny story. As Joel Osteen said, I'm going to tell you this story. There was a Seattle airport cargo handler who was unloading pets with some of his friends after a flight had landed and he's the cargo in the cargo hold and he's unloading some of the pets that had been put underneath the cargo bed to transport. They found that one of the dead, the, the dogs had died and they panicked. So they just made up something and they told the owner, Hey, your dog was misrouted to Phoenix. So come back tomorrow and we're going to give you your dog. And so that gave them time to go to the pound and find a dog that looked like the dead dog. So they could give this man and trick him and think this is not, this is your dog. So they got one that looked like the dead dog. They brought it back. But when they gave it to the man, he said, sorry, that's not my dog. They said, yes, this is your dog. He said, no, no, that's not my dog. They went back and forth. This is your dog. Yes, it is. This is your dog. He said, that is not my dog. And so they finally said, well, how do you know this? Is, this isn't your dog. And the man said, my dog was dead. I was shipping him back to be buried. <laughs> See, things don't normally come to life, right? Things like that. A couple of thousand years ago, something like that happened. Something that had never happened before. <laughs> I can't get y'all back. I got to wait a second. <laughs> A few broken-hearted people went to the tomb of a man that they loved. It was a man who had just recently died, and they are heartbroken. They had just watched soldiers crucify him, and they were told by an angel that he wasn't there. The tomb was empty. He is not here. He has risen. And that one simple fact, that one piece of news is more important than anything else that has ever happened in the history of the world. And to this day, all of, all of human history is roughly divided into BC, which is before Christ, what, what happened before Christ, and then AD, what happened after him. And the reason for that is not simply that the tomb was empty. It's so much more about where Jesus was, not where he wasn't. He had ascended. He had risen. And John 9, uh, 20, 19 says, on the evening of that first of the week, disciples were together. The doors were locked for fear. Jesus came and he stood among them. And the Bible tells us all of a sudden, Jesus is there. 
They watched him die. They saw him place, be placed in a tomb. And then they go to an empty tomb. And then, then within a few days, Jesus is appearing where they are. And he's speaking peace to them. He's letting them know there is peace. Now you have a reason to live. Now you have a reason to die. You have a reason to hope. You have a reason beyond all life and all death. All of a sudden, Jesus showed up to Mary and he's communicating with her. He, he's saying to Peter, listen, there, there, you, you don't have to go through life feeling guilty anymore. He tells Mary, you don't have to be afraid of anything, not even death. Peter, you can let go of the guilt because I know you failed me so many times, but not even because you failed me by denying me before I died because I'm restoring your hope. So peace be to you. Then he tells Thomas, his message was, you don't have to go through life doubting anymore. That's what the resurrection of Jesus is all about. It's, 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 you can live with faith. You can live with hope. And you can live with joy. That's good news. But is it true news? Did it happen? Many people don't believe that Jesus was raised from the dead. I've watched many of them. I've heard many arguments, but they haven't really looked at all the evidence. And we're going to look at some evidence today. Is there any historical evidence that Jesus existed? Well, the Bible, whether you believe it or not, is a very reliable historical source. There is nothing in the Bible that has ever been discredited by secular historians. There is never been a secular historian that ever discredited anything that's in scripture. They may not have liked it, maybe didn't agree with it, but they know there are original manuscripts. We know the Bible is an historical document. We have more and uh, or actually earlier manuscript evidence about the person of Jesus Christ than we do anything else in the ancient world. This is important that we know because I know I'm a Pentecostal charismatic. I was raised all my life and pastors and teachers taught me that Jesus was alive and I just believed it with no evidence because I had Jesus in my heart. I had experiences in the presence of God. But then as I got older and began to study the evidence, I thought I really don't need a lot of faith to believe in Jesus. I don't need to just hope that he's real. There's so much evidence that lets me know he is. I believed him without the evidence. Some of you did too. But how exciting is it to know that there is evidence? There is, there is so many, there's manuscripts that tell us who Jesus was, that the person of Jesus existed. And, and even there's more manuscript evidence on the life of Jesus, the scriptures, than there are Julius Caesar and Alexander the Great. How many of you believe that Alexander the Great and Julius Caesar lived? I don't, I don't know of any doubters that those, but I don't think Julius Caesar was real. We believe he was real. We read about him. I don't know about Alexander the Great. Yes, we do. And, but here's the reality. Even though you might refute Alexander the Great or Julius Caesar, when it's all said and done, it doesn't matter if you know or believe who Alexander the Great was. What matters is you know who Jesus is. And that you believe what he said. He asked the most important question that's ever been asked. He said, who do you say that I am? Who do you say? It all, it all matters. Jesus is what matters the most. And we have proof. We have written proof in a manuscript. And a manuscript is a handwritten document. And it's, it's what was handwritten before the printing press came along. They, they would write things down. They would write things down by hand. And, and so you can think about, just imagine how, how much time and effort went into reconstructing the pieces of the manuscript. And it was passed down. As a matter of fact, the manuscripts, the stories were written within 100 years of Jesus' death. So people were alive. There were eyewitnesses. There's so much. I'm telling you, I could be up here for six weeks and it wouldn't even touch the surface of what we know is true. And so they wrote it down. Take a, think about the time, the money, and the effort that went into handwriting the New Testament, just handwriting the book of Romans, 
writing it down word for word. That's what a manuscript is. Why is it important you understand what a manuscript is? It's because Julius Caesar only has 10 manuscripts. We only have 10 written manuscripts about Julius Caesar. Plato Tetralogies only has seven physical manuscripts or copies that's in existence. That's it. That's all that we have. And yet we base so much on their lives. Do you know why there are, okay, well, let, let, me give you the, let me give you some good facts here. Do you know how many manuscripts there are of the New Testament? Over 25,000. So there's no comparison. You can't even compare. And why are there so many? Because the Jewish Christians revered the Bible. They understood that it had to be written. It had to be passed on. The, the number two book in history, the Iliad, only has 1,900 manuscripts. And that Iliad is kind of like the, the Bible for Greek, the ancient Greek culture. And we've all heard of that. It only had 1,900 manuscripts. The New Testament alone has over 25,000 manuscripts. I think somebody thought it was important. Handwritten documents. You, you know, you need to know that your faith is not rooted in something that's mystical. It's not a myth. It's real. It's real. So there is, in, in terms of ancient manuscript evidence, there is strong proof, extraordinarily strong proof of the existence of a man named Jesus in Israel in the early first century A. D. And there would be even more manuscripts, but many of the manuscripts were destroyed when the Romans invaded and destroyed Jerusalem and most of Israel in AD 70 and killed most of the people, burned cities to the ground, persecuted Christians, and most of the survivors were forced into hiding. So we would see that this was a time of immense Christian persecution and an effort to stamp out Christianity. And still through the, through the persecution of the church, over 25,000 manuscripts have been found. Somebody tell me that's, that's got to be a miracle. That's a miracle. That's incredible. And, and they're finding that it, it, the more that the manuscripts that they have, the closer they can get to the original. So you want more manuscripts. You don't want less because it's hard. It's in pieces. And then sometimes translations might vary. But I'll tell you, there, there, there are all kinds of reasons. I'm just telling I'm not going to look at every single um, objection today, but you dive into it yourself. I want to also look at some more evidence, the evidence for the resurrection. It's important to understand that what we believe has evidence to back it up. 1 Corinthians 15, 14, the apostle Paul wrote, and if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless and so is your faith. Without faith in the resurrection, there would be no Christianity at all. Without the, the physical resurrection of Christ, Paul said our preaching is in vain. It's useless. It doesn't make any difference. There's no point in doing it, and so is your faith. Without faith in the resurrection, the Christian church would have never begun. The Jesus movement would have fizzled out. Christianity stands and falls on the truth of the resurrection, and once you disprove it, you have disposed of Christianity. And many people have tried. But God's people just keep moving. If you go to the Guinness Book of World, of World Records, you'll find one of the most successful lawyers in history. His name was Sir, uh, his, his name was Sir Lionel Lucku. And this is important. I told you I was giving you a lot of information today. Is everybody okay? Okay, good. All right. He was the most successful lawyer in history. He won 245 successful murder acquittals as a defense attorney. He was knighted twice by Queen Elizabeth. He was appointed to the Queen's Council to conduct work on behalf of the crown. Wouldn't it be amazing if we could have the legal opinion of a man that was that intellectual, like Sir Lionel Lucku? Well, the truth is we do. Because at one point in his life, someone challenged him to take it on and, uh, and apply his legal skills and apply all of that to the evidence of the resurrection. Many men have done this uh, uh, since then, and he spent years studying. 
and he began to apply the, the same debate skill that he had, that, that same way that he looked at evidence and he applied it to the resurrection. He studied the historical record and he finally said this in his conclusion. He said this, I say unequivocally that the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus Christ is so powerful that it compels acceptance by proof, which leaves absolutely no room for doubt. And, and this is not a, a Christian man. He did not get saved until after this experience. He was 64 years old when he gave his heart to Jesus. That is an amazing statement. That is an amazing testimony. So let's look at kind of what I believe that, that Sir Lionel would have looked at when he began to look over the evidence. One of the things he would have looked at to begin to see if the resurrection of Jesus was true is the evidence of the empty tomb. The evidence of the empty tomb, Luke 26, 7. We've said it many times. Luke looked in an empty tomb. He's not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was, in, he was still with you in Galilee, Luke said, the son of man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. So there are people that, that read this, but they still have objections to the resurrection. One of the reasons that they use to refute the resurrection is the first one is there's a swoon theory. This would be our first objection. If we were in a court of law and we were looking at the evidence, we'd say, no, wait a minute. If we're on the other side, we'd say there's a swoon theory. It was actually first proposed in the 1800s, and it's a theory that states Christ never really died. Somehow, he survived the beating. He survived the broken bones. He survived the, the loss of blood on the cross. He survived his wounds. Everything that he suffered sent him into a semi-coma. And when they took him off the cross and they put him in the tomb, he wasn't really dead. He was just laying there in, in a coma. That's, that's what many people say. And that when they brought the spices and, uh, to the tomb and they put him in a cold tomb, it kind of embalmed him. But his body was still alive and the aroma of the spices revived him. This is a theory that many people have. It says that when he came out of the grave, the disciples just assumed that he was resurrected. Well, if this, the I know, right? If this theory is true, if this theory is true, it means that Jesus successfully survived a severe beating and blood loss. They beat him. If you go back and read your Bible, they took a rod and beat him in his head several times. He would have had brain bleed. He would have had a swollen brain. There's no way he could have survived that. There's no way. He couldn't have just woken up without medical assistance. He couldn't have just, I mean, he was covered in clothes. He was covered in a, in a, in a wrap. He, how could he have taken up, stood up and taken all of his grave clothes off? Where was the blood? I mean, there's a lot of things to think about, right? Sometimes we, can, we don't always have to be, Jesus is alive because I believe it and I feel it. We can know he's alive. We can just use our critical thinking skills, right? I want to make sure that the next time you have a conversation with somebody who's not a believer, that you say, uh-uh, let me just know. I, I know that I know that I know, and not just because I'm emotional about it. Not just because somebody taught me as a kid. Oh, you only believe that because you were taught that as a child. No, I, I got evidence. Evidence that demands a verdict. He would have, he would have, his body would have been hardened by that, like plaster. He would have been, uh, he, he, how could he have overpowered four trained Roman guards? How could he, in a broken body state, moved a giant tomb that, that was a big rock away from, like, let's, can we, th let's think about this. This is not, Something that, that it, it makes sense to the critical thinker. The next objection would be the stolen body theory. That they stole his body. Some G say Jesus couldn't have possibly risen from the dead. That, that kind of stuff does not happen. People don't rise from the dead. So the body had to have been stolen. Somebody took it. Okay, then the question would be, who stole it? Is this helping anybody today? I love stuff like this. I don't know about you, but I, like, I love stuff like this. Matthew 28, 12 through 15 says, when the chief priest had met with the elders and devised a plan, they gave the soldiers a lar large sum of money, telling them, you are to say, his disciples came during the night and stole him away while we were asleep. 
If this report gets to the governor, we'll satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So the soldiers took the money and did as they were instructed. And this story has been widely circulated among the Jews to this very day. So first, the, the uh, theory results in three possibilities. The first one is the Roman government stole the body. The second one is the Jewish authorities stole the body. In both of these scenarios, two groups have absolutely no motive. See, we're, we get to be like lawyers today. We need to look at this from like, wait a second. They would have no, it would not have, if, if they had produced a body, it would have crushed the growing movement of Christianity. So they would have loved to have done that. Why would they still? No, they'd say, no, here, his body, he's dead. He told you he's coming back, but he didn't. He's still dead. They would have loved to have produced a body. That would have been incredible. They would have crushed Christianity before it even got started. And they desperately wanted to kill it and keep it out of existence, put it out of, its, uh, out of existence. And it would have saved the Romans, the, the authorities, a lot of time, a lot of money, a lot of effort. They wouldn't have had to pursue any more Christians and they definitely would not have had to persecute them. It would have been over. Your God is dead. We see him. Third, they, they said the disciples stole the body. If you think about it, they have absolutely no motive either. They were not highly motivated to have the unspeakable privilege of living as penniless evangelists. They weren't excited about the idea of wandering around for the rest of their lives, tortured. Come on. They, they, they didn't, that wasn't something that they would have done. Being beaten, whipped, thrown in jail, put to death. Every one of the disciples was in a, a position to know whether or not Jesus had risen. They were running and they were hiding and they were afraid. They didn't believe it. Jesus told them many times and by their actions, they did not believe it. All but, and, and at the end, of, at the end of, of this season, of this time, all but one of the 11 were put to death. So this is not something that they would have had a motivation to steal a body. They believed that he was, that he was who he said he was. And six were actually tortured to death through crucifixion. Peter was hung upside down. I mean, these guys gave their life, not just for what they believed, but for what they saw. And, and, they, and, and the truth is, people die for their faith all the time, right? The, the, here, here's the difference. Here's the difference. People will die for their faith if they believe it is true. People don't die for their faith if they think it's false. They will believe it. Nobody knowingly dies for a lie. And the disciples were so certain of it that Jesus had risen. They staked their lives on it and they lost their lives for it. Then the third objection is the hallucination theory. What happened to the, what happened to the body? Many people say, well, it was a mass hallucination. They just all saw stuff that wasn't real. They all saw the same thing. Well, that's absolutely never happened. When people, when they've studied people that have taken LSD or a, a drug that kind of puts you in a hallucinogenic state, you, if all of us took something and that caused us to hallucinate, we'd all see something different, but they all saw the same thing. So that's, that objection is not the hallucinations are not group events. No one has the same hallucination. No one says, Hey, remember that dream we had last night? No, I had a dream. You had a different dream. A psychiatrist would even tell you that 500 different people having the same hallucination at exactly the same time would still be a miracle, right? Wouldn't that even be a greater miracle, even of the resurrection itself? Come on, you can't get away from this. They weren't expecting the resurrection. The Christ followers were perplexed. They were scared. They were discouraged. They were depressed. They'd lost their leader. They never expected an actual physical resurrection. According to church historians, we know Thomas was put to death in Southern India. Thomas was the doubter. He was the least person expecting the resurrection. He died preaching the gospel. He didn't believe it when they told him, Thomas said, I need to see Jesus. How am I always the last one to the party? Thomas shows up late to the house after Jesus had appeared to him. 
And, and Thomas is, is saying, I need to see him. I need to see his hands and feet. You got to show me. Do we have any show me people in the room? I believe it when I see it. That's who Thomas was. He was a, if you show me, I'll believe it, but I'm not going to believe it just because you said it. And Thomas died for his faith. Jesus appeared to believers and unbelievers. Acts 2.22, speaking to a crowd. After Christ ascended to heaven, Peter said, men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus, the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs, which God performed through him in your midst, just as you yourselves know. What was their reaction? Did they respond with angry fists? Did they begin to yell? We don't know what you're talking about. We don't understand what you're saying. We've never seen any signs and wonders. No, that's not what the crowd did. Historian will, history shows us 3,000 of them, 3,000 people that very day when they heard of the resurrection, as Peter began to preach, they agreed with Peter and they believed in Christ. They saw something. They witnessed it. They knew Peter was speaking the truth. See, they already knew the reality of his miracles. They had been following him. Thousands had been following him and they were eyewitnesses up close and personal to the miracles of Jesus. Many of them had witnessed them and they knew the reality of his death and they saw him die. And now they believe in the reality of his resurrection. So much so that 3,000 people were converted. And there's so many more theories like the wrong tomb theory. The truth is, if it was the wrong one, we're, that must mean there's a right one. Okay, I mean, so what are you left with? The Bible records more than 500 witnesses saw Jesus alive. They saw Jesus alive after he came back to life. 500 people saw him. It's recorded. So belief in the resurrection message spread like wildfire. They couldn't kill it. Timid fishermen and accountants were suddenly and radically changed. They begin to preach the gospel and they refuse to back down on their story of seeing Christ raised from the dead. They wouldn't quit. They wouldn't give up. That same very disciple who three days earlier backed down and denied Christ when challenged by a little servant girl was now willing to stand and declare the resurrection happened. And he went to the grave rather than renounce that he'd seen Jesus alive after his death. Jesus had said, in essence, to the crowds, I'll prove to you that I'm God by raising from the dead. That might seem so bizarre, but historically, it's exactly what happened. There's so many things that evidence of an empty tomb, evidence of fulfilled prophecies. There's so many prophecies in Zechariah, Malachi, Psalm, throughout, throughout Isaiah, so many incredible. One of the, and I'm going to read some of this over and talk about some of this over Easter, but just a few of them that were, that were in the Old Testament that were prophesied, he'd ride in Jerusalem on a donkey. Zephaniah said that. Malachi said he'd enter the temple. Psalm said he'd be betrayed by a friend. Zechariah said he'd be sold for 30 pieces of silver. Zechariah said the silver would be thrown into the temple. I mean, I can keep going and keep going. And they distinctly, significantly, intricately described exactly what happened to Jesus in the Old Testament, hundreds of years before it ever happened. So we have the evidence of an empty tomb. We have the evidence of fulfilled prophecies. We have the evidence of eyewitness accounts. Acts 1, 3 said after his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave them many convincing proofs that he was alive. First yes. Corinthians 15, 3 through 8 says, for what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance that Christ died for our sins according to the scripture, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time. Somebody say, at the same time. Most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. And last of all, he appeared to me as to one abnormally born. Paul said, I'm the weirdo, and he came to find me. Right? And so this is so important because this reference is Paul sealing the argument. Yes. Wow. 
There's nothing you can say. It happened. You can deny it, but that just means you're asleep and you cannot doubt. Paul is throwing down a challenge. He's saying, if you doubt him, there are plenty of other people around that will say what they saw. Right? And I got a whole lot of other things that we could talk about, but the last one is the evidence of changed lives. That's the, all the evidence I need because Jesus changed my life. When I met Jesus as a little girl, it doesn't mean I haven't had difficult moments. It doesn't mean I haven't wavered in my faith. It doesn't have, it mean I've had moments that I, I was like, God, where are you? If you were so good, why would you let these terrible things happen to me, to my family and people around me? And I just keep going back to the resurrection because the resurrection is proof of changed lives. There are agnostics, there are atheists that are now believers because they begin to apply the same evidence, the same skill of searching out the evidence. And at the end of it, they had all built these incredible careers on being an atheist and talking about atheism. And now they're sitting on major podcasts going, I'm a believer. I don't know what else to tell you, but I looked at the news. I looked at at the history. I looked at the evidence, and Jesus is alive. Edmund Bennett, 20 years dean of law school at Boston University, investigated the resurrection and believed it. Frank Morrison, a journalist and lawyer, set out to disprove the resurrection, investigated it, devoted his life to Christ as a result. Josh McDowell, a young agnostic going to law school, investigated the resurrection, was converted, and has helped convert thousands of young agnostics, wrote a book called The Case for Christ. Actually, evidence that demands a verdict. Read it. Lee Strobel was an award-winning legal editor at the Chicago Tribune, an atheist. He investigated the resurrection, became one of today's great apologists. So many more. I could keep going. I could keep going. What, what, What do you think? What happened when Jesus died? Peter went back to fishing. Everybody just went on back. Mary came to the tomb at Easter thinking she was going to anoint a dead body. She came ready with all her oils, all her spices. She didn't come thinking she was going to discover an empty tomb. She did not come thinking that she would not find her Savior, her Lord Jesus. She came to anoint a dead body. In fact, when she first saw him, she thought he was the gardener. When the other disciples heard what the first eyewitnesses said, they didn't even believe them. I just, I feel so much better knowing that the disciples had such little faith. Makes, does that make you feel a little bit better? These were not giants of the industry. These were people like you and like me. But what happened after Jesus was resurrected, he came and he showed up and their initial reaction was fear. They thought they were seeing a ghost and he had to say, touch me and see. See, that's the evidence of, ta- of changed life. When Jesus touches you, you'll see. When you have an encounter with Christ, you'll see. I once was lost. Now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. Thomas, the doubter, he, he was saying, I, 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 I've got a, I need hard evidence to believe you. And what happened that changed that band of frightened, discouraged, depressed followers and turned them into people with courage and conviction? What was it that changed Peter that into a coward, into this confident communicator? What was it that replaced Thomas' doubt with this firmly held faith that went to him, with him, that went with him to the grave? What, what, what was it? What happens when I believe what really happened on the cross? How does that change how I live? The cross transformed history, but the resurrection transforms me. It's the resurrection of Jesus. He wants to change your life today. He wants to resurrect your life. If you're you're not a follower of Christ, maybe you're here today and you just need a revelation of the cross of Jesus. You just need a moment with him. Just a moment that he'll say, try me and see, touch me and see. You'll see I'm real. You'll see I am exactly who I said I am. See, God is calling all of us back to the cross. God today is calling all of you back to the cross. That's where everything changed. That's where blood was spilled and sin was canceled. At the cross, 
was where forgiveness flowed and sin was no longer an issue because of the blood of Jesus. Covered all of our shame as it spilled out. Covered all of our past and God is calling us back to the place where Jesus died, where he suffered. He's inviting us back to the place where shame was covered. He's inviting us back to the cross and he's leading us to a better way to live. A resurrected way. The way of life. The way of hope. The way of eternity. I'm reaching for somebody today. The resurrection of Jesus is not a myth. It's a miracle. There's hope today. God wants you to experience his son Jesus, to experience the life that Jesus can give you in this room. See, you gotta you got know, if God can do a miracle on the cross, if he can do the miracle of appearing to that many people, if there is so much evidence to believe that Jesus is real, then he can do a miracle in my life. What God can do for you is small. It's nothing for God. Nothing is impossible. Now unto him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all. Now unto him who is able to keep you from falling. Now unto him. He's able. You just need to believe. I know for some of us, man, we get in our head. I got to figure this out first. I, you're kind of like Thomas. Well, I have hope today because Thomas was one of the most radical disciples for Jesus that ever lived. And I believe that God wants to do something in your heart today to resurrect your life. I want you to pray with me today. With everyone praying with me, eyes closed, head bowed, if you could just for a moment. I believe there's people in this room that need to experience the hope of Jesus. The resurrection of Jesus is not a myth, it is a miracle. And that same resurrection power that raised Christ from the dead, if you are a Christ follower, dwells in you. If you're not, that same power is available to you today. The same resurrection power is available by the power of Jesus. John said, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Today, you've heard some truth and maybe you're still wrestling with some things. Maybe you're still figuring some things out. Can I just encourage you? You could spend hours and hours and hours deliberating, debating, searching, researching. But let me ask you, what are you sensing right now in this moment? If there is any way that even a little bit of it is true, all of it's true. All of it's true. Sometimes we can be so contingent on thinking about it and figuring it out and making sure when really we just need to believe. And when you believe and you say, Lord, I need to know, I need to see the scars. I need to see, I need to know that it's you before I believe. Jesus is saying, I'm right here. His presence is here, right here. If you'll just touch, you'll see he's real. And I'm praying that by the power of the Holy Spirit, the people in this room that might be in the middle of making a decision, maybe you're right on that edge, that today you would make a decision to make Jesus the Lord of your life. Maybe there's people in here that are Christians and you've let him be savior, but you've never let him be Lord. You've never let him lead in your life. You are still at the helm. You're still behind the driver's seat. You're still making all the decisions. And Jesus is saying, if you'll let go and let me lead, I will show you the greatest life you could ever imagine. There's people in this room today that would say, Jesus is saying to you, if you would just let go and allow me in, if you'll just allow me to come in, I will show you unsearchable things. You don't have enough time to search out what God can do. So don't waste any more time. Make him Savior. Make him Lord today. If you're in this room and you would say, that, that's me. I'm one of those two. He's not my Savior and he's not my Lord. I've never let him in. I've never given him full access. Never opened up my heart and said, come in, Jesus, and take over and forgive me of my sins. The Bible says you need a Savior. You need a Savior. Today is the day of salvation. Stop running from it. Stop thinking you'll do it another time. Today is the day. 
If you're here today and you would say, that's me, would you pray for me? I'm just gonna include you in a prayer. I'm not gonna ask anybody to get up or come down, but I do wanna know who I'm praying for. If you're here today and you would say, that's me, I need to give Jesus my life. I need forgiveness of sins. Does it matter what your past is? We've all got pasts. We all have mistakes. Nobody is perfect, but we came to a perfect Jesus. And if you're here today, would you lift your hand and say, pray for me. I need to make Jesus the Lord of my life. Is there anyone in this room today? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Maybe you're here today and you've made him Savior, but he's not Lord. You've never really committed your life to him completely and totally and said, Jesus, take the lead. You've forgiven me of some things, but I've never really served you like I should. Today is that day where everything changes. Come on, is that you? Lift up your hand. Is there anyone here today that I'm ready to make Jesus Lord? Yes. Yes. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. I want to pray for you in this room today. If everyone pray this out loud together, say, Dear Jesus, I come to you today and I give you my life. Today I believe that you are the Son of God who died for me and rose again. So today I give you everything. I ask for forgiveness of sins. Thank you for taking away my past. Today I make you Savior and I make you Lord. I confess you as the Lord of my life. I give you everything. I surrender everything in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Come on, welcome to the family of God. Welcome to the family of God. Come on, Epic Life Church, can we celebrate? Let's all stand today, let's stand.